Hi folks, this is April James, and thanks so much for listening to the number one award-winning show, Fat Burning Man, where we talk about real food and real results. On today's episode of the show, we're here with Dr. Janae Davika, and we're going to talk to you about how you can get your veggies on and even trick the people around you into eating veggies too. If you think you know all the sneaky little uses of cauliflower, then you haven't listened to the show yet. So enjoy it. It's going to be fun. Now, before we get to the show, I want to let you know that our online community, the Fat Burning Tribe, is up and running. We have a few hundred members who've been sharing recipes, doing some webinars and training sessions and Google Hangouts, and it's been boatloads of fun. So if you'd like to learn more about, let's see, our next Q&A session is about sugar addiction, and we're talking about breaking through your plateaus and have loads of other recipes and other material. So if you'd like to come hang out with us, you can actually join the Fat Burning Tribe for a limited time for just a dollar. If you go to fatburningtribe.com, uh, then it's $27 a month, but we're going to be raising that as well soon too. So if you'd like to join in the fun while you still can, we get that first round and wave of super passionate fat burning tribers, then go to fatburningtribe.com. And as always, this show is entirely listener supported. There's no advertising sponsors or anything else like that, aside from, of course, our membership community and the cookbooks and stuff that, that we come out with. But if you'd like to support the show, please take a moment to forward fatburningman.com or this show to a friend or leave a quick review on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, wherever you're listening to this show. I really appreciate it. So just as a quick wrap up, uh, Paleo FX just happened and it was such a blast. Jonathan Baylor stayed at my house, the New York Times bestselling author. Uh, I had a lot of people over for cooking and eating and drinking and Let's see, I did a panel with Mark Sisson and Rob Wolf, which was a bunch of fun. I also did one with uh, Tucker Max and a motley crew of people about self-reliance and how you can actually be self-reliant in the modern world, what that means. Uh, very, very cool stuff. I love where some of these conversations are going. So we're going to be, you know, I had a lot of great conversations with leaders in the movement uh, at Paleo FX. Expect a lot more fun people to be on the show in the next few weeks and months ahead. Now, on to the show with Dr. Janae Davika, who also was at my house doing some cooking videos over Paleo FX, which we'll be releasing to you guys soon. We talk about why real food heals better than drugs, the secret to dairy-free clam chowder, and why you should eat your veggies with your veggies, how to trick your family into eating veggies, and 10 sneaky uses for cauliflower that will absolutely blow your mind. All right, let's go hang out with Janae. All right, folks, Dr. Janae Davika is a family nurse practitioner, a holistic chef, extraordinaire, and master of the healing arts. What's cooking, Janae? Oh, everything's cooking. <laughs> nice. Something delicious. Whole foods, that real foods, <laughs> lots of yummy desserts. That's what I like to hear. So thank you so much for coming on. Actually, um, for the folks out there, Janae is uh, one of the many people coming over next week for Paleo FX to hang out at the house, do a bunch of cooking. We're gonna run some cameras and make a bunch of cooking videos. So I'm really looking forward to that, but I'm glad we could squeeze this in beforehand. It's gonna be amazing. Yeah, totally. So um, why, don't we, why don't we catch up? Because you have, you've done so many things, you have so many projects and such a wealth of experience. Why don't you tell, um, tell the folks who might not be aware of where you came from, what you do uh, about your work and, and how you got into it? Okay. Um, just a quick background as, as a kid, I was sick all the time. So it started out with allergies I probably missed one out of every three weeks of school. And it was always like upper respiratory stuff and allergies and just not feeling good. A lot yeah. of digestive issues. And so my mom took me to all the regular doctors first and they gave me all the pills and some surgical procedures. And of course that didn't work. And so then we went to the naturopathic doctors and the energy healers and they gave me herbs and homeopathic remedies mm -hmm. and teas and diets and that uh, worked a little bit, but it still wasn't fixing the problem. And um, so I, I just started, I, I was searching, constantly searching for whatever it was that was going to make me feel good. By the time I was in my 20s, I was really sick. I had um, a paralytic colon, so um, food could go in but not come out, and that caused lots of toxicity. And then obviously that caused a lot of other health problems. Sure. And so um, I, I went on all sorts of crazy diets. So I went on the macrobiotic diet. I went on juice cleanses. I went on raw vegan diet. And I went into all of those different diets 
uh, wholeheartedly thinking that, okay, this is what's going to fix me. Mm -hmm. And I had a doctor that told me, um, he's like, listen, you just need to go on a diet of just fruits and vegetables and that's it. And I had been including lots of fruits and vegetables, sure. but when, when he said you have to do that and that's all, I just remember sitting there and crying my eyes out. Cause I just thought to myself, I'm going to starve to death. Like yeah. there's no possible way <laughs> to get enough food in. And, uh, so I did my best, and um, when I was in my when I was in my late twenties, I had to get my colon removed. I got really sick. I was having kidney and liver issues, and the doctor said the only way to that you're not going to die is to get your colon out. And so they removed my colon, and that just started a series of problems all yeah. by itself. And yeah. so you know, Western medicine had failed. I tried the alternative approach and that had not fixed the problem. And, but, you know, I always thought, okay, food somehow, somehow what I eat is going to fix this problem. I just didn't know how. And I, I went to all these different trainings and I, I went to this camp where for three weeks I was getting trained in uh, a reflexology sort of modality. And there were, what I didn't know was that room and board was included. And it was out in the middle of Montana. There was nothing for millions of miles around and and all he could eat was what they had there and they had a whole foods raw food high plant-based diet and and I was stuck there and there was no way I could cheat there was no way I could you know if I needed to emotionally eat or if I was hungry or I wanted something else or I wanted a yeah. snack there was nothing there right and in three weeks I lost 30 pounds wow previous to that I had high blood pressure high cholesterol uh blood sugar dysregulation, all of that got fixed. My acne went away, my hair stopped falling out, and it was just amazing. And it was then that I made the connection between what I ate and how I felt. And mm -hmm. I knew that it was, a, it was a line, you know, that could be connected directly. And so then it was a question of, you know, how do I sustain this? Because while I was there, I, you know, I make jokes about it now, but I called home, you know, like, oh my gosh, I'm in fat camp. I'm going to die. <laughs> you know, they're trying to kill me. And it was not pleasant and the food wasn't good and, yep. and it was painful, but I saw how much better I felt. And when I came home and went back to my regular diet, even though it was healthier than anybody I knew, mm -hmm. um, I started getting sick again. Mm -hmm. And so then I started, uh, the, you know, approaching it a different way. And so I looked into all these diets that I tried. I looked into like the raw vegan diet, the regular vegetarian, vegan diet, macrobiotic. I looked into all those diets, um, and paleo wasn't a big thing back then, but you know, the paleo, what, what used to be paleo back right. then. And I looked into all that and I, and I started looking at it with different eyes thinking, okay, what works with that diet and what doesn't? And I looked at it from three different perspectives. I looked at it from how, how is it working for me personally? And then I looked around at all of my peers and thought, okay, how is it affecting them? Because some of the people that were doing these diets were robust and strong and healthy. And some were like, skinny and pale and emaciated right. and they yeah. just didn't look healthy at all. And so I so I was trying to see, you know, like what what really made a robust healthy person that was going to live a long time a healthy happy life and then what wasn't working because all of those different diets had people on both ends of the spectrum. And then I started going I, I went back to school I got my nursing degree and my graduate degree in nursing and as I was doing my thesis work I went over thousands of papers <laughs> regarding mm -hmm. diet and, you know, how to how to maintain health or how to prevent and reverse chronic illness with diet. And so taking those three things and kind of combining them together, I figured out like what, you know, what's the magic, uh, what's the magic in a diet that makes it work, meaning making someone healthy and vibrant and preventing and reversing chronic illness. And so that's been my last 10 years of studying, trying to figure all of that out. And uh, in the meantime, I healed my body. So I was so sick. I was in the hospital and I was, you know, nearly dead several times. And I, I went from that to being healthy, going back to school full time, raising a kid, you know, doing lots of really hard things that yeah. there's no way I could have done before. And people, friends and family came up to me and they said, how did you do it? What did you do? And so I started teaching and I noticed that people kept asking the same questions mm -hmm. over and over and over again. And that's, that's how my classes started. And, and I realized that people really want to do what's right for their body, but a lot of times they just don't know where to start. Yeah. And there's so much misinformation out there 
that they just get confused. So they try to do stuff like I did, you know, in the beginning of, of my journey and it doesn't work. And so then they get frustrated. So, so now it's my passion to help people sort of reinvent themselves and reinvent their health with food, with whole real foods and, um, teach them how to basically solve their problems because it's not just a diet, right? Your food is, linked to your emotions and your psychology and your social relationships and your, and your, uh, you know, everything else in your environment. And so people would say things like, well, I want to do this. I want to do the right thing, but I can't because, you know, I can't give up ice cream or my family won't accept it, or I can't, um, I don't like cauliflower or whatever. <laughs> right. You know, so there's all these objections that would come up even yeah. when they knew what they should do. Mm -hmm. And so I started creating a program that helped people overcome these, these problems or these barriers to success that would come up over and over and over again. And really like once I listed them all down, it's, you know, like 50 barriers to success that mm -hmm. come up for everybody sure. all the time. And, uh, so, so I started creating a program for that. And so I help individuals figure that out and figure out solutions to whatever their barrier is. And then I also noticed that my colleagues in, uh, in the medical field, as I was working in hospitals and clinics, um, not only were the patients not happy, like they went in because they weren't feeling good, whatever it was from, you know, they're the biggest complaint is I don't feel good. And they would leave with a prescription and they go get the prescription filled and then they come back to the doctor. Well, that didn't really work. I still mm -hmm. don't feel good. And I never had anybody come back saying, thank you for <laughs> that prescription. It yeah. totally changed my life. Right. But when I started teaching classes, teaching cooking classes and incorporating all my talents as a chef and into these classes, people would come back to every single class saying, you know what? I feel better for the first time in my life. Yeah. You have changed my life, not with a prescription, but with food with the power of healing medicinal amazing food and so uh i write out on the prescription pad now you know <laughs> change your diet and i tell people how to do it and help yeah. them through that and i also help practitioners i you know uh practitioners only have a few minutes to deal with a patient right the patient comes in they've got five to seven minutes to write them a prescription and send them out the door they don't have time they don't have resources. They don't even have the education. We're not trained in medical school how to do lifestyle interventions mm -hmm. with people. And so they don't have the time or the resources or the staff or the know-how how to do it. And so the other thing I do is create uh, programs for medical practitioners, doctors and nurses and other practitioners so that they don't need extra staff or time or money, but they can still provide these nutritional and lifestyle interventions for their patients. Very cool. So to get back to your earlier question, the one that everyone asked you, um, what did you do and, and how did you do it? Okay. So basically when you boil it all down, um, after all the research papers and all my experimenting, it boils down to getting rid of the bad stuff <laughs> and eating lots of the good stuff. Right. Yeah. And so the bad stuff being, you know, processed food and we, you know, I, I'm sure everyone that listens to your podcast knows the long list of all the bad processed foods that are, are hard on your biology and that have, have, uh, you know, they create inflammation and create sickness in many different ways. Uh, the good stuff being, uh, I found that while, while most diets uh, focus on the macronutrient content and adjusting that, your carbs and your proteins and your fats, I found that the golden <laughs> the golden elixir of life is actually in the micronutrient content. Mm -hmm. So what's the concentration of micronutrients in the food and how do you get that micronutrient concentration to be as high as possible? And to do that, you have to follow your food from seed all the way to the sewer. So from the time it's planted yeah. to the time you poop it out, yeah. every there's like a hundred and there's more than a hundred places in between those two places where the, ma the the micronutrient content can either be maintained uh, or destroyed mm -hmm. or actually enhanced. You can enhance it as well. And sure. so how do you do that? And then the other thing is, you know, most of the micronutrient rich foods are your plant foods, your vegetables. And of course, the, the problem is, uh, especially in the paleo community, you know, like it's it's easy to sell people bacon and it's easy to sell right. people paleo desserts. Oh, you but, can eat chocolate. 
Exactly. But it's so hard to sell, like, eat lots of vegetables. And the research I did, it showed, you know, like the five a day vegetable and fruits challenge. Like that's, it's nothing. That's not going to do anything. I mean, it will help, but, but really when you want to get up to the therapeutic benefit of vegetables, it's we're starting at nine to 13 servings a day, which is five to six and a half cups of fruits and vegetables per day, which far exceeds pretty much anything anybody's yeah. eating in any diet. Right. But that's where it starts. Yeah. And so how do we do that? You know, how do how do we get people to love their vegetables enough and to to be engaged enough with micronutrient content to really make that feasible. Yeah. And so that's that's where like a lot of my recipes come in is I try to make vegetables delicious and i disguise vegetables as other things so people don't know they're eating vegetables like for instance uh i just invented this really amazing clam chowder that we're gonna make when i come to your place and uh it's not made out of milk there's no dairy in it at all it's made out of cauliflower so we've got this clam chowder that has a cauliflower base so you're getting like 10 servings of vegetables in a bowl of clam chowder, which is crazy. So when you when you start to look at vegetables a different way and prepare them a different way, it really makes it possible to get enough micronutrients in your diet to be able to heal your body and and do all these things. Vegetables, it, it prevents cancer, yeah. you know? It, it can turn around diabetes. It can turn around heart disease. It can clear up your skin. It can it can reverse digestive disorders, like IBS and Crohn's. Like, it can do so many things. But you've got to look at the micronutrient content. Yeah, absolutely. It was really interesting. I was at a, a mastermind with a lot of people in, in health, a lot of people who have um, their own practices, maybe they're doctors or folks like me, lots of authors there as well. Mm-hmm. And and one of the speakers, I think right after I spoke, I think got up on stage and he's just like, pretty much all of you are here. What you're teaching is to tell people to eat more vegetables, right? And we're all just like, yeah, pretty much. That's that's kind of the secret of all of this. And but but the hardest part of that is not knowing that you should eat more vegetables. I think every single person on earth knows that they should probably eat more vegetables. The hardest part is actually getting people to do it. I can tell you, you'll be proud of me right before this. This is like my seventh interview today, I think. And uh, wow. Allison and I just had a, uh, a green smoothie. And what we typically do is we fill it up. This is a pint glass for those of you who are on audio, but uh, a pint glass full of green smoothie, and then I drink another half one. That's what it usually comes out to. And Allison nice. drinks like a full one. But we're just rocking out on vegetables. We need almost two fridges just to fit all the veggies in there and to make sure they keep fresh. <laughs> now, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you what what's your secret for getting people to actually eat the vegetables or consume them in one way or another? Well, it's it's. You, you kind of have to rearrange their perception of what vegetables are. So normally, you know, you think of you the standard. <laughs> yeah, well, not trick them, but just re-educate them. Yeah. So the standard American plate, you've got your, you know, you've got your meat and you've got your carbohydrate, whether, you know, depending on which diet you're following. And then you've got your little side dish of vegetables. And most people think, okay, my little side plate of salad or my little side of steamed broccoli, like I'm eating vegetables, right? Yeah. And, and. That's what I thought. But when I, you know, when I went to that camp where I was totally, you know, my body was totally healed, Mm -hmm. the whole plate was vegetables. So it's like changing your mind from I'm eating some vegetables to vegetables are the main meal for every single meal and everything else is kind of a condiment. Everything else is the side dish. So you do this with like, like full meal salads. So your whole plate is filled up with salad and you still can have your, you know, your meat and your tubers and stuff like that. But that's the side dish. The vegetables aren't the side dish. Yeah. You know, for breakfast, if you have your smoothie, your whole glass is filled with, you know, 80 to 90% vegetables. Mm -hmm. And, um, and just kind of tweaking recipes like I do with my recipes. So, you know, clam chowder, instead of it being 90% milk, it's 90% cauliflower. And Mm -hmm. so you're sneaking the vegetables in. So once you train people that their main meal has to be vegetables, then they start thinking about it totally differently instead of just thinking, okay, I would have to eat 20 side dishes of vegetables to get that much. And and that's not possible. But when you're thinking, okay, my main plate is vegetables and everything else is a side dish, then it starts to retrain you to think about it differently. Absolutely. And there's also ways like um, 
for instance, with cultured vegetables. So Mm -hmm. um, like sauerkraut, there's lots of ways to do that. But when you culture vegetables, you're increasing the micronutrient content by hundreds or thousands of times, just Mm -hmm. depending on how you process it. And so when you show people tricks like that, like, you know, you don't have to eat six cups of sauerkraut because, you know, a quarter cup of sauerkraut has the nutritional content many times of, you know, a whole bowl of greens. Mm -hmm. And so show people tricks like that so that they can still be getting massive micronutrient content in, in a smaller package. And there's lots of tricks and ways to do that. Totally. Yeah. One of the most frustrating things about going out to eat is when you get a side of vegetables, which I always do, you know, like sub the starch usually for a side of veggies. And so they'll mm-hmm. bring out, you know, this enormous steak and this enormous side of, uh, of potatoes usually, if you don't ask for the vegetables and, and then they'll bring out like four string beans that have, you know, probably came <laughs> from a can and are all floppy and definitely not fresh mm-hmm. and th- that tiny little bowl. And that's, you know, like your veggie serving. That's not a serving of vegetables. Uh, right. that, so let me ask you this. You said uh, most of the meal should be like a salad. Is that every meal? How are how, like how many veggies do you actually have to work in from a rubber meets the road standpoint? Not necessarily like every meal doesn't necessarily have to be a salad. So no. veg- having all those vegetables doesn't mean it has to be a salad. So for instance, you um if you make a soup, right? You can make a soup and it can be mostly vegetables with a little bit of meat in there, right? Mm-hmm. So so if you have a vegetable soup that's, you know, 75% vegetables, then you've got uh, uh, you've got that. So you could do a soup, you could do a salad, you could um do uh I do lots of uh bowls where you mm. take vegetables and you steam them and you put them in a bowl and if you're if you do safe starches or grains you can throw a little bit of that in there and then you put sauce on top of that so you've got this giant bowl of vegetables yeah. with a little bit of grain or a little bit of meat and some sauce and then and then that's just an easy dinner bowl or lunch bowl so you could do salads you can do bowls you can do soups you can do smoothies juices your your 14 day juice cleanse thing yeah. is an amazing way to get like you know five, six, seven servings of vegetables in one cup. So, yeah. so when you think, uh, it's just thinking about it like that, like how can I get the most vegetables into this meal and how can I make the meal mostly vegetables? Mm-hmm. Now let's, this is, I was not planning on doing this, but I think this could be fun. Okay. Cauliflower. You mentioned you mm-hmm. use that to make chowder. Um, mm-hmm. Cauliflower is one of the least sexy vegetables there is, right? Like most people don't get stoked about cauliflower. Exactly. Why, could I have you, and, and I'd be happy to offer up some as well, but could I have you just uh, walk through a few of the fun things that you can actually do with cauliflower? Because it doesn't have to be boring. Oh, you bet. Okay, so I just, actually, I'm I'm writing a new recipe book with all my cauliflower recipes in it because I've just been having so much fun yeah. doing this. And they're kid-tested and kid-approved. My daughter, nice. my daughter keeps telling me, Mom, is this made out of milk or cauliflower? I can't tell. And I'm like, I'll never tell you. I'll never let you know. That's awesome. Um, So um, all your cream soups, so like clam chowder, potato chowder, um, cream of broccoli soup, Mm -hmm. all of those can be made with a base of cauliflower. And all you do is you blend up the cauliflower, you steam the cauliflower, blend it, add a little bit of uh, vegetable seasoning and some salt and maybe a little bit of butter if you do that and some cashews to make it creamy put Mm -hmm. that in the blender and it makes your soup base so any of your cream soups can be made with cauliflower uh i just started making alfredo sauce with cauliflower so cool we do either veggie pasta or brown rice pasta and we put alfredo sauce over the top of it with you know you can do a chicken or sausage Mm -hmm. or whatever protein you want to put in there um we also i just did a um Al gratin potatoes instead of making the sauce with dairy, you make it with cauliflower sauce. Oh, cool. And so it makes this creamy al gratin potatoes that get all bubbly just like the regular ones. And um, so, so you're basically eating vegetables with your vegetables. So then you can make <laughs> also a, you know, do the white sauce like a bechamel sauce or something to put over broccoli, steamed broccoli or asparagus or something like that. And so, you know, just stuff like that works really well. And then with the au gratin potatoes, instead of using potatoes, there's so many awesome roots you can use. So you can use like rutabaga, turnips, mm-hmm. um, uh 
oh gosh, which one did we just use? Kohlrabi, which is a, oh, cool. it's not a, it's not a root, but you chop yeah. up the bulb of the kohlrabi and put it in there and you make the au gratin potatoes with that instead. So you've got cauliflower sauce, which is vegetables on top of vegetables. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and you can totally pull it off because really when people are eating, what do they want? They want the sensation of that right. comfort food. Mm -hmm. They want the emotional response of the comfort food. So when you eat something creamy like Alfredo sauce or clam chowder, what do you love about it? The you creaminess. Love that it's creamy. Yeah. <laughs> you love that it's creamy. You love the texture. You love that it's kind of buttery. You love that it's, you know, just kind of like soft and how it goes down. And you like the way that it makes you feel and maybe right. it's linked to memories. And so what we need to do is figure out how to replicate all of those emotions and all of those sensations so that all of that's the same, but it's made out of something healthy. And I think you're going to be blown away when I come over to your place and make it for <laughs> you. You're going to love it. <laughs> so cauliflower, a few of the ways that we've used it that are that are more creative. Cauliflower rice, a lot of people in the paleo community mm -hmm. might be familiar with that. If you're not, uh, very easy. You essentially just take raw or slightly cooked cauliflower and uh, and turn it into little pellets. And then it's very, very close to rice. You get that mouth feel, you get that similar sensation. You can season it in a similar way that you would with rice, but basically you're skipping the starch and you're adding extra veggies in. Anytime you can, you can do that. While some people do um, pretty well with starch, others don't at all. And for most people, especially if you want to lose weight, having veggies with your veggies is the best way <laughs> to accelerate your results. It, it, it's really creative. We've also done uh, we, we've used cauliflower as the main ingredient of our crusts in some cases. And we tried it with pizza. The first time we did it, it was miserable. It, we totally screwed it up. But that's part of the fun too, right? It's like you um, yeah, you get creative and you start with uh, all of these raw vegetables. And then through uh, alchemy and pure creative energy, you turn it into something awesome. So that's uh, – I, I love your approach and I love that you um, – are creative with the way that you use veggies. And I think you're right. We're going to have so much fun uh, when you come over. So what are some other creative ways we can kind of sneak vegetables into the diet? Well, uh, I've got a really amazing, uh, I'm giving away everything we're going to do when we come to you. <laughs> that's fine. It's really just a teaser. Cheese sauce. Uh, um, people, that's one thing they can't give up, right? Ice cream and cheese sauce and chocolate. Sure. And, yeah. And so, um, got a really great cheese sauce that's made out of red peppers and cashews and lemon and wow. some herbs and spices. And it has the mouthfeel and the sensation of cheese, but it's made out of vegetables. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty creative. And um, I've, I've also, I know, I know that one thing that holds people back from eating a lot of vegetables is they take a lot of chewing, right? So if you've got this giant yeah. plate of salad or vegetables, you're just like, oh my gosh, it's going to take me My jaw gets to sore sometimes. That. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, mine too. So I've been getting really creative with blending things yeah. and kale is one of those things that I love to eat a big plate of kale, but it just takes so long to chew it's it. work. Yeah. So I, yeah, this, the, the latest recipe that my family has just been loving, even though it looks kind of weird is we take our steamed kale, throw it in the blender with a little bit of chicken broth and a little bit of Kerrygold butter, blend Ooh. it up. And it makes a creamy, like the, you would, you would think it wouldn't be good, but the consistency is really creamy. If you close your eyes, it kind of feels and tastes like you're eating a cream soup. Hmm. And when you're looking at it, it's this bright green bowl of, <laughs> looks like bright, bright green bowl of sludge, but uh, <laughs> it's really delicious. Or you could put, you know, that same dish, we put a little soy sauce and a little bit of toasted sesame oil in it and gives it an Asian flair. Sure. But that makes it possible to eat like a giant plate of kale, but it's in a little bowl of soup because it's all condensed down and then it doesn't take hours to chew it. Yeah. And I found that makes it a lot easier as well. So blending things up makes it tons easier. No. Um. What about um, crusts, whether they're with desserts or things like uh, uh, pizza or kind of like pastry type things? How can you do that with a veggie? We've had lots of hits and misses. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I have not been successful making desserts with veggies yet. Mm -hmm. Mostly it's entrees, sides, salads, soups, and smoothies and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I haven't had a lot of success with desserts and veggies together, but I'm, I'm going to keep trying. We have some of those. For, <laughs> Do you? Yeah. Great. Oh, totally. Yeah. Um, Tell me. Actually, got this from my mom, um, red velvet cupcakes, muffins. Mm -hmm. Um, is what we'll make a lot of times. And, and actually they used, it didn't used to be made with like artificial red food coloring. It was right. made with, with beets. And so okay. 
we use beets and sweet potatoes a lot um, instead of flours because okay. it comes it comes with a fiber. It also gives it a really nice um, whether it's in breads or in in like muffins or anything like that. It gives it a really nice moistness and. Mm-hmm. You know, gluten, for those of you who don't know, is generally the thing that makes it it allows uh, pastries to do acrobatics that you basically can't do without gluten. It's the thing that, you know, makes those pastries super puffy and really, really light. And so uh, one of the, I guess, I guess weaknesses of of veggies or not using gluten and totally screwing up your gut is that you're you're kind of stuck with denser type desserts, denser type baked goods um, mm-hmm. but you can use that to your advantage i think if you make it nice and moist yeah. right like if it's dense and moist it's kind of like fudgy uh and you can even make breads that way and mm-hmm. and toast them and then it comes out a little bit closer to breads if you want to stay from away from grains um but there are some other things too like if you get into using a dehydrator which we do all the time actually this is this is one that's made by a friend but we've tried making it at home as well this is one of my favorite things ever is a uh, it's a cracker that's like chia seeds red pepper um, a little bit of groats and a few other veggies thrown in there a little bit of cayenne mesquite and a few other things that I'm forgetting right now but you basically put that in you you, you flatten it out on the dehydrator after you've blended it all, all up, of course. And then you come out with this incredible cracker that's pretty close to something that would be super high glycemic, like rice, mm-hmm. like a rice cracker or a wheat right. cracker. Um, but you're eating veggies once again, and you sneak them in, and then you can awesome. put veggies on top. It's awesome. Awesome. Veggies on your veggies. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your favorite veggie? Oh, gosh. I, You know what my favorite thing to do is? I don't know that I have a favorite veggie, but I love going to the store, to the produce aisle, and finding something that I've never tried before yeah, and weird. bringing it home. So last week, we did that with kohlrabi. I was like, I, I've never seen a whole kohlrabi before, so yeah. brought it home, and the cashier asked me what I was going to do with it, and I'm like, I have no <laughs> idea. I'll tell you when I'm done. And so I love I love having weird vegetable nights. Yeah. And I also love going to ethnic restaurants and a lot of times they'll have weird vegetables that I've never heard of before. Um, Yeah, we had a lot of fun in in Thailand when we went mm -hmm. there because we're just like, what is all of this crazy stuff? I've never seen it before. The fruits, mostly the fruits, but um, the veggies there were just so cool. And and the closer that you get to traditional foods, the more fun you can have with a lot of veggies because, you, I mean, you eat a typical baked potato i remember you know like eating a baked potato growing up was pretty boring i never really liked them that much because most potatoes that you get in the u.s are pretty boring um but if you go to like a natural food store or certainly your farmer's market you get all sorts of crazy potatoes and they're all Mm -hmm. different colors and shapes and sizes and when you eat them they taste like something Um, well they taste amazing yeah we got these uh these potatoes that actually had uh I i think it was like a tan outside and so we're just expecting them to be kind of you know maybe a little weird or something we opened them up and they were the brightest purple i'd ever seen and they tasted like grapes yeah and i I had had like um, purple sweet potatoes before but they didn't really like taste like purple this tasted like purple and i thought that was the coolest thing (laughs) (laughs) very nice that's awesome that's awesome one thing i love though is uh greens like i'm really getting into uh nutrient dense greens Mm -hmm. because if you go if if you look at the concentration of micronutrients in food greens are some of the highest micronutrient foods out there yeah and so i'm experimenting with uh growing greens in my little garden. I just live in a tiny duplex and I've only got a little like six foot by three foot garden space. It's tiny, but I'm growing lots of greens and herbs in the garden. And I planted it maybe three years ago. And it's just fun to see all that stuff come back year after year without me even trying. And I go out every day and I just pick whatever greens are coming up in my garden. We've got dandelion and comfrey and mullein and, uh, and all sorts of herbs, uh, uh, basil and peppermint and you just throw them in a smoothie or a juicer and make sauces out of them and that's been really fun too and um when you get into the herbs and the greens like you are just power packing your meal with all those yeah. disease fighting uh micronutrients that are just gonna super power everything you eat with those in them totally so we've talked about veggies why don't we talk about some herbs that you like to use because like you said they're not just for seasoning they actually really do enhance 
the the bioavailability of a lot of the nutrients if you combine them in the right way um and and, and it gets really interesting when you look into that but what are some of your favorites well as as an er i'm an herbalist as well and as an herbalist like um we were taught how to help people heal with herbs like Mm -hmm. they are actually medicine you make your medicine out of herbs and so some of my favorite herbs are just your garden herbs like you know that come back year after year i I, Mm -hmm. i'm not one of those high maintenance garden people so i like to just plant it once and have it keep coming back um marjoram and all your italian herbs so oregano marjoram Mm -hmm. basil thyme and then you've got your sage those are all great um, some other herbs that are more, more medicinal than culinary, but I have those in my gardens anyway, is dandelions, mm-hmm. um, mullein, uh, burdock roots, comfrey. Cool. Yeah. Uh, and I got all those seeds by walking down by the river <laughs> and no they were all growing. Yeah. They were all growing down by the river. And so I would grab the seeds and throw them in my garden. We were walking by the river and there were these giant dandelion leaves that were like, no kidding. They were almost three feet tall. And I was just like, holy <laughs> cow, those are huge. Yeah. And so I got the seeds planted them in my garden and now I have the mammoth dandelions <laughs> in my garden. That's awesome. And so I love just going hiking or down by the river and finding whatever edible our herbs are down there, throwing them in my garden. And um, we use them for food, but we also use them for medicine. So like, for instance, comfrey is really good for burns. And yeah. so whenever somebody gets burned, my daughter runs out to the garden and grabs the comfrey and puts uh-huh. it in the mortar and pestle and makes a little poultice out of it. But we also put it in our juices and, yeah. you know, throw it in salad and stuff like that. So those are those are my favorite herbs just because that's what I have here in my garden. But yeah. um, just depending on where you live and what the climate's like and what's available. Um, herbs are great because they're most of them are weeds. Isn't yeah. <laughs> That's the awesome thing about right. herbs is they're weeds. And so they take care of themselves and they're mm-hmm. wild plants, they're wild food and the wild food is the most healing and the most nutritious and the most nutrient dense. And it's the wild food that heals your cells and, yes. and turns on all that good DNA and all that good genetic expression that we all want. So right, any exactly. kind of wild food that you can get is going to be amazing. And it's so neat. We've, we've lost sight of a lot of this, but where um, even a lot of alcohol started was more on the medicinal herbalist side of things. I watched mm-hmm. a fascinating documentary about absinthe and how that used to be made and, and how Originally, it was made by a woman, and then this like man, businessman, marketer came in and basically like stole the recipe or bought it or something like that. And they all thought that she was a witch. And then he went and marketed it, and then it blew up because like it was used in the military and stuff. And then it was it was just so fascinating. But basically, the uh, the way that it was created originally what was was what from the herbs and the plants that were growing in the region at the time. And they just found kind of like this perfect concoction um, that would um, help uh, correct certain ailments. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, of course, we don't really think of the things that we drink, certainly not alcohol like that today. But that's, you know, we we only really have to go back a few decades before that was the case. You you would use these infused drinks. Mm -hmm. Even that's the history of soda, which is (laughs) pretty wild. And we're just such a far cry away from that with... It doesn't matter if it's booze or soda or pretty much anything mm-hmm. else in life. And it's I'm so happy that there are people like you spreading the message, bringing us back to where we came from originally, which is, you know, everything has the opportunity to heal you if it's made with real food, real plants. And I, I just think that the work that you're doing is absolutely awesome. And I'm stoked that you're going to be here next week and we're going to have so much fun. We're almost out of time. But before uh, we go, please, Janae, let folks know what you're working on now and uh and where they can find you all right well you can find me at cafe com, c-a-f-e-j-a-n-a-e.com and that's my free website and it's basically meant to be a resource for anybody who wants to upgrade their food choices so it's not necessarily centered on any diet but it's high raw um whole food, real food, um, nutrient dense, concentrated recipes. And so whether you're on the standard American diet and you just want to find replacements for all your comfort food, or if you're, you know, a raw foodie or a paleo person that just wants to add more vegetables to your diet, it's got, I've got tons of recipes and tips and tricks. And so that's my uh, main website. And then, uh, I also have a membership program where I coach people how to, how to uh, transform their lives with food. So that's also, you can reach that through cafejanae.com. 
Awesome. Janae, thank you so much for coming on. This was a lot of fun. We'll have to have you on again soon to chat about other favorite vegetables and, and other things you can make with cauliflower. Awesome. Thanks so much, Abel. This was great. Thank you.